Welcome everyone to the webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Jessica Delaney and uh, I'm, I'm joined this evening uh, by a few panelists who we will get to uh, introducing. We have um, an, a, a full hour um, put aside for our time together today. And again, wanting to welcome you to the Teachers Pension Plan Retirement Health Coverage webinar. Um, the purpose this evening is really to share information with you and to answer any questions that you might have Wanted to let folks know that this evening's webinar is being recorded. And so uh, for that reason, we would ask that you don't share any personal information in the question and answer panel. Uh, we would like to share this recording with other members so that if they are not able to attend, they will have access to uh, the same information. Uh, we will also have the opportunity to post questions anonymously. So would encourage you to do that when we get to um, the question and answer uh, portion of the webinar. Welcoming everyone, wherever you may be joining us from, uh, many of you may be joining on traditional and unceded territory, and I am joining you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Silks Nation in the Okanagan. For this evening, I'd like to introduce uh, the project team, um, but beforehand, I'd like to first introduce uh, Reg Bawa, and uh, Reg is the uh, chair of the Teachers Pension Plan Board of Trustees. Uh, Reg was appointed to the board in July 2010 by the provincial government. He is currently the Assistant Deputy Minister of Policy, Programs and Partnership at the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. He received his professional um, accountant designation in 1998 and has been in public service for over 30 years, which I find hard to imagine. But I will hand that over to you, uh, Reg, to say a few words and to start this evening's webinar. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Teachers uh, Pension Board of Trustees, I'd like to welcome you to, to today's webinar on understanding the plan's retirement health coverage. The board is currently reviewing the plan's retirement health coverage program. Uh, retirement health coverage is optional and member funded. We review the program periodically to ensure that coverage and premiums provide the best value for members like you. Your voice is important to us and we, as we complete this review, uh, and we are excited to offer you the chance to share your input uh, through an upcoming survey, uh, which will open on September 18th. Uh, the information presented today uh, in today's webinar uh, will help you understand what is currently covered under the program and how the engagement process will work. Uh, our focus uh, for 2023 uh, is to gather feedback on options for uh, potential changes uh, to the retirement health coverage program. Uh, we will consider a member feedback, uh, feedback from uh, today, uh, alongside uh, plan usage, industry, industry trends, uh, expert advice, and other factors in our decision making. Uh, we will share uh, information uh, about the results of the engagement in uh, 2024. Uh, if the board uh, moves to decide or moves ahead uh, and decides uh, to make changes uh, to the extended health and dental plans, they will be announced in the fall uh, by the fall of 2024 and will become effective on January 1st, 2025. Uh, we thank you for taking the time to attend uh, today's webinar and appreciate uh, your input and interest. Uh, we are pleased uh, uh, to have with us today uh, Jessica Delaney uh, with Delaney and uh, Joanne Jung, uh, Pharmacy and Clinical Practice Leader with WTW. Uh, Jessica will share uh, uh, more information about Delaney and WTW momentarily. Uh, over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we are going to um, get started. And in terms of our time together today, we'll do some brief um, introductions of uh, the project team. And then we will um, share a little bit of information and save time at the end for your questions. Um, as Reg mentioned, my name is Jessica and I'm here to support the engagement process. And I'm joined by my colleague, Brittany Mason, um, who will do her level best to support folks if you have any um, technology challenges um, or anything like that. And we'll also be posting links in the chat. 
Um, and as Reg mentioned, I uh, wanted to introduce uh, Joanne Jung from WTW. Uh, Joanne is a pharmacist by trade and has more than 20 years of experience in both clinical and policy settings uh, and is an expert advisor to the board. And so uh, I will review sort of the process and what we've heard in our first phase of engagement. And then Joanne will um, be available to share information about your current plan and answer questions that folks might have. So really uh, the purpose of this webinar is to share information uh, with members about um, health coverage, answer any questions you might have before completing the survey. Um, this webinar has really come about from what we heard in phase one, where we engaged 60 retired uh, members who um, told us that teachers like access to information. So they told us, don't ask us to complete a survey without giving us the information we need to complete that survey. So um, it's really in part uh, thanks to um, members who participated in phase one that we are here today uh, to share this information with all of you. In terms of uh, the next uh, 50 minutes or so, um, we're going to give you a little bit of background about the engagement process. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to Joanne to talk about the current extended health coverage. And then we'll uh, wrap up with next steps. We anticipate taking about half an hour or less to share information and looking to uh, allow at least 20 minutes for questions. When we do get to that question um, period, I will remind you at that time, but there is a question and answer panel that you should see at the bottom of your screen and you can uh, pose questions anonymously as well. So we'll review that again when we get to uh, the, that portion of the webinar, um, but you are welcome to post your questions questions at any point in time. So in terms of the background for um, this initiative, uh, we really wanted to make sure, and, and Reg and the entire board really wanted to ensure that the voice of members um, was considered throughout the whole process. And so this is a, a very typical sort of uh, good governance review of um, the extended health uh, benefits, and it is member funded. And so it really wants to make sure that, uh, that it meets the needs of members. Uh, member feedback will be considered throughout the decision-making process, as will um, data utilization and Joanne and her team's good advice to the board in terms of good governance and management of the, plan of the benefits. And finally, wanting to make sure um, that the benefits reflect the needs of matter members, that it's modernized, and that it's that good balance, trying to find that sweet spot between cost and coverage. Uh, and so that's what um, the, the goal is uh, of this initiative. In terms of the timeline, uh, last fall, we had an opportunity to engage about 60 retired members who were actively enrolled in the Green Shield program. And so that gave us an opportunity to hear from their perspective what was working well and what could be improved. And we'll share a little bit of what we learned with you this evening. In this second phase, the webinar is about sharing information and answering questions, but the real push is an online survey that we'll be launching next week on September 18th, where we're really going to go to a broader membership, and that's uh, retired members who are with Green Shield, retired members who are not, and then active members within five years of retirement. So we're really looking to hear from quite a broad group um, of, of folks who are in the plan. Uh, as a neutral third party, our role will be to report out on what we hear, and uh, we will do that early in 2024 and share that with the WTW and, of course, the board as they look at potential options. Uh, any potential changes would be considered over the summer, and implementation would happen no sooner than January 1st, 2025. So again, this is uh, a thoughtful process that will take place uh, over time and really with the voice of members at the center of the, of the decision making process. So I'm going just to take a moment to share with you uh, what we heard. Again, this is from uh, 60 retired members who are in Green Shield and um, and who come from you know across BC and a few of them were living out of province as well. So first and foremost, they were generally satisfied with the plan. Uh, they were open to trade-offs. Um, there was different levels of sort of cost tolerance. So some members said I'd be willing to pay more to get more and others said cost is the most important factor to me, don't raise prices and cost the premium. So there, there was mixed feelings on that. 
Um, there was general satisfaction with the um, deductible. However, we did hear that there was um, some um, sort of opportunities to perhaps reduce some costs overall. Uh, and again, participants valued really that access to information. Even within the sessions, we heard you know different participants saying, well, this is how I use my dental benefits, or this is how I use that. And so there was a really good exchange of information. In terms of drug coverage, and Joanne will review what your plan currently uh, covers in terms of extended health. Uh, generally, drug coverage was um, very satisfactory. Folks appreciated the coverage. Um, some members in more remote communities felt slightly penalty, uh, penalized by the cap on the dispensing fee. So um, if they don't have a, a Costco or, or something like that, it, it felt like it could be um, a little bit of a penalty. Uh, there was significant interest in the shingles vaccine uh, and some travel vaccines and sort of looking to explore what, what those opportunities might be. Uh, and members, um, you know, really wanted to make sure that any changes would be equitable and would not be seen as being punitive on, on potentially uh, members who had higher use of uh, prescription drugs. Paramedical are things like um, massage and chiropractor and physiotherapy. Uh, and we heard from members um, that everything's becoming more expensive. <laughs> and so uh, a massage doesn't cost what it used to. And so there was certainly a strong desire to uh, extend the paramedical coverage, to have more providers and to have uh, a larger amount of coverage, uh, largely to keep track with increasing costs. So that was something that we heard um, when we asked about paramedical. Same thing with uh, services and supplies. So the cost of eyeglasses, if anyone's bought a nice <laughs> pair or even a, a modest pair of glasses, uh, it costs a lot more than it used to. Uh, we're talking several hundred dollars and the same with hearing aids. And so uh, members were keen to see that the plan would keep pace with inflation and with increasing cost of medical supplies. The dental coverage, not everyone who engaged was enrolled in the dental plan, and several participants felt that the dental coverage was expensive relative to what they got. So this here was, uh, I think, more or less this feeling of um, not being sure if it was uh, providing good value uh, for the members who were in the plan. So that is a, a very quick synopsis of what we heard in phase one. And again, that was really looking to listen and learn from members who are currently enrolled in the Green Shield Plan. Uh, in this second phase, we are looking to hear from retired members who are not enrolled in the plan, those who are, and active members within five years of retirement, because whatever changes are contemplated by the board um, would likely impact those members as they seek uh, to retire. So uh, we will be uh, sharing with you some links in the chat so you can bookmark the page. A survey will be open from the 18th of September until October 10th. Um, we really want to make sure that if a survey doesn't work for folks, that you reach out to us. Um, there's a phone number that we will share in the chat as well as an email address. And so if folks want to be interviewed, uh, it, um, they are more than welcome to contact myself uh, or one of my colleagues through that email and phone number, uh, and we'll interview them. Uh, and we we have found that sometimes, you know, it just feels like there's more to say than what you, you have to say in a survey. So we would certainly welcome the opportunity to connect directly with members um, if they would so wish. So that's a little bit about what we heard in phase one uh, and where we're heading in phase two. And I'd like to turn it over to Joanne now um, to review your current extended health. And this is really being done um, because in phase one, we heard from members that there's sort of a mixed understanding um, of what is currently covered uh, and what some of those trade-offs might look like. So I'd encourage you to, to tune into Joanne and to, um, to think about any questions you might have and we'll be happy to address those at the end of Joanne's presentation. So without uh, further ado, Joanne, I will turn it over to you and I'll look to advance the slides of how I think they should be, but you let me know if uh, I need to go slower or faster. Thank you very much, Jessica. So as uh, many of you probably don't use every single benefit that's covered under your extended healthcare coverage, so this is an opportunity to provide that education. So as you go to the survey, and we hope you all do, that you make an informed decision. And we thought that providing this education and going through each element under your healthcare coverage would be helpful for you when you want to understand how it works today, 
and then maybe where you want to go in the future. So this is your plan. And that's where we're going to start with premiums. So premiums are what you contribute every month uh, for the coverage. So premiums cover the cost of health claims paid by the plan and a small portion for expenses paid to GreenShield to administer the plan. So for example, providing the communication, the member website, um, their call center. So those are all included within the premiums paid to the plan. So if you see here, the extended healthcare premiums effective February 1st of 2024, or sorry, 2023 are here and it varies whether you're single, couple or family. So how premiums are set, they're based on the utilization of the benefits. And also WTW, my organization provides support to the board by testing the premiums for reasonableness and market competitiveness. And we negotiate these rates on behalf of the board to keep them as low as possible and make sure they're in line with expected utilization in the coming years. So these are set every February 1st and we're in negotiations right now for the next round of uh, premiums. And just wanna emphasize again, none of the money collected for these premiums goes to the teacher's pension plan. They all go to Green Shield to mostly cover the cost of claims. So the next item and the biggest item under your plan are drugs. So all prescription drugs uh, marketed in Canada that are medically necessary are covered under your plan. There are certain rules though within the drug plan. First of all, you don't have any annual maximum under this plan. There's an overarching lifetime maximum for extended health that we'll talk about later, but no annual maximum. The coverage includes mandatory generic substitution. So what that means is if you fill your prescription for a brand drug and there's a generic equivalent on the market, then your plan will only pay up to the price of the generic. So the brand drug's a dollar a pill and the generic is 25 cents a pill and you choose to get the brand name version, your plan only covers up to 25 cents per pill. If you have a medical reason why you can't take the brand, you can submit a request to Green Shield for consideration to be covered for the full price of brand. Or if you wanna lower your out-of-pocket costs, pharmacies will happily switch you to the generic version so you get full coverage for your drug. The other item that uh, Jessica touched on earlier is dispensing fee cap. As many of you know, pharmacies charge different dispensing fees. You have Costco that charges $4.49 to some of the independent pharmacies and smaller remote communities that tend to charge more. Your dispensing fee cap aligns with Pharmacare's dispensing fee cap, which is at $10. So there are tools in place to be able to shop around um, to different pharmacies to find one that has a more reasonable dispensing fee. The other uh, pricing rule under the drug program is called reference drug program. And that is that falls under BC Pharmacare's RDP program. What that does, it's slightly different than mandatory generic. It groups drugs that treat the same illness together in the same drug family. So for example, for cholesterol drugs, we have about seven or eight different types of cholesterol drugs, very similar in structure, and they act very similarly within your body. But they, there's a slight price difference between each of those different drugs. And if you get one that's one of the more expensive ones, then your the plan only reimburses you up to the most cost-effective drug within that category of drugs. So for example, if you're looking for a car, if the plan covers cars, um, you have the Tesla, the Mercedes, and the Honda Civic, the plan will only cover up to the price of the Civic. And then finally, we have what we call a biosimilar strategy. So biosimilars are drugs similar to generics for biologics. So these drugs are made of proteins, so vaccines, insulins, and some of the very expensive drugs that treat cancer, and some of uh, the autoimmune conditions are called biologics. When their patent expires, then the competition is available and other manufacturers start producing that same drug. And that's called a biosimilar. 
and the plan will only cover biosimilar versions if there is one available. For example, insulins is where you might notice this the most and some of the more high cost drugs. So in a nutshell, that's basically your drug coverage and it covers all drugs that are medically necessary. The second piece that's very important to understand when we think about your drug plan is BC Pharmacare. BC Pharmacare is BC's publicly funded drug formulary. So a provincial drug formulary is a list of drugs that are eligible by the BC government and it's available to all BC residents. So how does it work? Not all drugs that come to the market are automatically covered by BC Pharmacare. There's an expert review committee that selects which drugs should be added to the formulary based on clinical evidence and value. In fact, most new drugs that come to market in Canada, even though they're more expensive because they have a fresh patent and there's no generics available, they may not, most of the time, they actually don't offer additional clinical value over cheaper drugs that are already in the market. So Pharmacare will look at what the drug is and are there cheaper drugs already on the market treating that same condition? And then they make their decisions accordingly. So ultimately they cover about 50% of the drugs on the Canadian market. The teacher's pension plan formulary or list of drugs that are covered is much more comprehensive and it covers almost all prescription drugs in Canada that are medically necessary. There may be some exclusions as you know, like vaccines, drugs for cosmetic use and over-the-counter prescriptions are not um, eligible under the plan for the most part. So why is it important to understand BC Pharmacare? Pharmacare, by using drugs covered under Pharmacare, helps the plan in terms of being more cost effective. And also BC Pharmacare will start paying for that drug once you start accumulating up to your Pharmacare deductible. And then that saves you money by lowering your out-of-pocket costs and also saves the plan money. The other type of drug that's very important to consider are high cost drugs. Now that only represents about 5% of plan members are on these very high cost drugs that cost over $5,000 per person per year, up to hundreds of thousands of dollars a person per year. And the market is evolving. Technology for drugs is increasing and there are more and more of these very high cost drugs entering the market. And Pharmacare covers a good portion of these high cost drugs. So that's why Green Shield will require that you apply to BC Pharmacare first and as well as Green Shield when your doctor prescribes you a prescription that's very expensive. Now we're gonna shift over to paramedical. So your plan covers specific paramedical providers. They're listed here and the reimbursement per limit is limited to a reasonable and customary charge. So you may go to your a massage therapist and wonder why am I paying so much out of pocket? That's because every insurance company sets a reasonable and customary rate. Otherwise, if there's no ceiling, then providers will charge as much as the market will bear. And so this annual maximum is combined with all these practitioners, there's different ways of uh, designing a plan. Some plans have um, coverage and limits per practitioner. This plan combines them all. So if there's one practitioner you want to go to, then you can use all of those funds towards your massage therapist, for example. And the reasonable customary charges are set and changed by the insurer periodically. And each insurer has different reasonable and customary limits, which are proprietary that they don't share with the public. Otherwise, the providers will start charging um, according to the, what those limits are. And I also want to add that all practitioners must be licensed and regulated by their respective uh, governing bodies within the provinces. Last but not least, under the healthcare plan are services and supplies. So that includes hearing aids that are covered at $1,400 every four years. It's not per hearing aid because some people need one or two. So it's a combined uh, maximum of $1,400 every four years. There's also orthopedic shoes coverage and orthotics. $400 is the combined maximum. 
And note that some of these medical supplies may require prescription uh, from a practitioner. So for example, orthotics require prescription from a physician, podiatrist, or a chiropractor. So for details on this, please check the Green Shield booklet um, to see what's eligible and who the um, eligible prescribers are. And then finally, we have vision care. Um, the limit is $300 every two years for adults and every year for children. Included in $300 is an eye exam. Um, there are, we know that there is a lot of inflation with designer glasses, but we're also seeing opening of more discount retailers, there's spec savers, for example, and online um, optical stores as well. But, you know, this is an area that um, potentially could be enhanced um, if we look at other areas to um, modify. So we had talked about deductible, uh, Jessica had referred to that uh, from phase one and what is a deductible? So the de deductible refers to the amount you must pay for yourself or for your spouse or dependent at the start of the calendar year before you start getting reimbursed for your expenses. So this plan has a $200 annual deductible that's set January 1st. So as you start accumulating claims and they add up to $200, after that time, the plan starts paying for your claims according to the coinsurance, which we'll discuss in the next slide. Now the deductible does not apply to hearing care or vision. If you have an eyeglass expense and you have no other expense and you submit that claim January 2nd, then that will be paid right away. You don't have to satisfy the deductible before the plan starts paying for hearing care or vision. There's also an overall health maximum. Even though there's no maximum on drugs on an annual basis, the entire health care plan has a $200,000 lifetime maximum. So that's why when we talk about pharmacare, uh, for example, it's important to try and get drugs um, that are covered by pharmacare, and then we can shift, try and shift some of those costs and leverage pharmacare to lower uh, or slow down accumulation towards the health uh, overall health maximum of two hundred thousand dollars. If uh, you are close to reaching that maximum, you will get a letter from Green Shield Canada to warn you that you are approaching that maximum. So now we wanna talk about coinsurance. Coinsurance is the percentage of the eligible amount that you or your spouse or dependent is entitled uh, to be reimbursed for after the deductible has been reached. So after you start submitting claims, going to your pharmacy, and then you pick up your prescription after you've fulfilled your $200 deductible, if your prescription's $100, and then the plan starts paying 80%. So 80% is the coinsurance paid by the plan. So the plan would pay $80 of that prescription and you would pay the $20. However, there is protection in the plan for high out-of-pocket costs. So if you reach $1,000 of claims paid by the plan, doesn't include your out-of-pocket costs. Um, for example, you may be on five different medications that add up to $1,000 paid by the plan. Then the plan starts paying 100% of your eligible expenses for the remainder of the calendar year. So based on that, if I do some math in my head, the maximum that you would pay after your deductible would be $250 out-of-pocket and after $250 out of pocket, um, then the plan was convert from 80% of coverage to 100% coverage for the balance of the calendar year. There are exceptions to this rule, just like the deductible, hearing care, vision care, emergency in, in province expenses are covered at 100% right away up to the annual, the maximum. Some of them are annual, some of them are biannual or every four years. In addition, this plan is designed uh, to favor Costco. So if you fill your prescriptions at Costco, the coinsurance is 10% higher. You would get reimbursed at 90% as opposed to 80% by filling your prescriptions at Costco. 
Now we are going to shift it over to the dental plan, which is a separate plan with separate premiums. So here are the dental premium rates effective February 1st of 2023. Uh, similar to the extended healthcare plan, the monthly rates are based on utilization of the plan. And again, WTW provides support by testing these premium rates and conducting our own analysis to negotiate with GreenShield when they set their rates as well. Um, some of the things that may cause inflationary pressures on these dental premiums are things like the dental fee guide. So last year, the dental fee guide increased by 7%, and that sets the rate at which GreenShield pays for certain procedures. Um, and again, none of these premiums go to the teacher's pension plan. All of the premiums are paid to GreenShield to cover the cost of the claims submitted to the plan and a small administration fee to GreenShield to adjudicate the PEL plan. So this is a busy slide, but essentially there are two different types of dental plans. We have the essential plan and the enhanced plan. So both the essential plan and enhanced plan cover basic services and comprehensive services. So under basic services, you have your x-rays, oral exams, cleaning, and fluoride treatments, as well as fillings. And both the essential and enhanced plan cover 70% of eligible costs. Included in this is 13 units of scaling, and 13 units of scaling translates to three hours and 15 minutes because one unit of scaling is 15 minutes. So that is uh, your design under the basic services. Under comprehensive services, the essential plan and enhanced plan also cover up to 70% of eligible expenses and it covers denture services, oral surgeries, endodontic and periodontic treatments. And then finally, we have major services. So it's only the enhanced plan that covers major services like crowns, bridges, and dentures, and repairs of, of those crowns and bridges. Uh, so there's no coverage for major services under essential and 70% coverage under the enhanced plan. So the difference between the enhanced and essential is not only does the enhanced cover major services, is that the essential plan only has a $1,000 calendar year maximum combined for the basic and comprehensive services. And the enhanced plan has a $2,000 calendar year maximum combined for the basic comprehensive and major services. So if you're currently um, enrolled in the essential plan and you want to upgrade to the ascent to the enhanced plan as long as you have enrolled for at least two consecutive years you can do so however if you're in the enhanced plan you cannot downgrade to the essential plan so just want to remind everybody how it works when you if you want to change your option into the future So now for next steps, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica and would be happy to, we are staying around if you have questions about the presentation. Thanks so much, Joanne. I'm sure that we will have um, questions. That was a lot of information and I um, thank you for, for going through that. Wanting just to um, highlight for folks that in the chat, um, Brittany has posted a series of links um, to where you can find uh, additional information on your current benefits. And we'll also post a link where you can bookmark the page for when the survey goes live on the 18th of September. Uh, in terms of next steps, um, really this is um, your, your plan and uh, the board wants to ensure that they have a good sense of the needs of members uh, while they look to modernize the plan and ensure good value for money uh, and long-term sustainability of the plan. So uh, that website um, the link will be open until October 10th. And then as a neutral third party, um, we will report on that back to the board and to uh, WTW. 
Uh, in terms of our time together, we will be using the question and answer panel, and that is at the bottom of your screen. You may choose to post a question and select either anonymous or not in terms of um, that question, and, uh, and we'll do our level best to respond to it. I would ask that um, folks do not put any identifiable information um, and look to really keep the questions at a level where the response would benefit more than yourself. Uh, and uh, and again, we have Joanne and Reg here uh, who will, will do their best to um, answer questions. And um, this will hopefully benefit uh, other members who are later sort of viewing this and, and may also have questions. So um, I have a question for you, Joanne. Uh, and again, I encourage folks, you can post those questions using the Q&A uh, panel. And I will do our, we'll do our best and get as many answered as possible uh, between now and 6.30. Um, and so there's a question here about special authority, Joanne, and mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 there's a member who's posted that they received uh, a special authority for an expensive drug um, and that Greenshield said they had to pay the full price because a special ex um, authority had expired. So the question is, um, does a special authority expire and um, what suggestions might you have in terms of how do they go about getting that special authority back because it is an expensive drug that they are looking to have covered? Well, that's a great question. So generally speaking, uh, expensive drugs do have a limited approval period by Pharmacare, which can range from um, six months to maybe two years. So the way that they can extend it is their doctor would need to apply to Pharmacare again to apply for a renewal of that special authority coverage. And the best thing to do is to go back to their physician and ask them to apply to Pharmacare for a renewal of that drug. And then they can submit that to Greenshield. Thanks, Joanne. Um, there's an acronym that I don't recognize in the chat. So I might just check in with you, Reg, um, and, and you may or may not know. So um, by all means, just sort of pass and I'll ask the, the member just to repost. But it, the question is, does TTOC teachers have a plan? And I'm not sure what TTOC teachers is, so maybe you can jump in and help me. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a teacher, but I do know what I do. I do know what that is. That's a teacher on call, um, and so this really pertains more to active teachers and their uh, what coverage that they might have. Okay, um, and would um, a teacher on call um, be? Um, able to access the plan as a retired teacher? Um, is that something that, that you know, Reg? Yeah, once a teacher retires, uh, then they would have access to the same plan as any retired teacher. So uh, I can't, uh, I don't have the confidence to answer the question about an active teacher and their coverage uh, within their district. So we may have to just park that one. Okay, thank you, Reg. Um, Joanne, you wanna jump in? Yeah, I do. Um, I am familiar with the active teachers plan. Um, under the standardized provincial active plan, the uh, coverage is a managed formulary. So it's a restricted list of drugs. Um, I'm not, I can't answer the question around eligibility for a TOC though. Okay. Thank you, Joanne. <laughs> Um, Joanne, we have another question for you um, around the dental plan. And as you'll recall, we had lots of these questions in the first phase as well. Um, and so the question from uh, a member here is if one doesn't have um, a dental plan, like they're not enrolled in the plan when they retire, um, can they join at any time? So maybe you could just talk us through what some of the current um, timing and sort of some of the limitations around the dental um, plan is for retired members. So they're currently not on the plan, but they would like to join. Um, I would have to take that away to check with BC Pension Corp around enrollment because I don't want to be guessing. Um, I'm familiar, very familiar with the design, but in terms of the logistics around enrollments, I think we can take that away. That's okay. That sounds good. Um, this is um, a question to both of you, and and you you may or may not know. So we'll we'll do our level best. But the question here is around: if you have a sense of all of the retired teachers from the plan, what percentage of those are in Green Shield? 
Um, do we have those sort of sense of, of sort of either a percentage or even a bulk number in terms of how many people are in the plan? I believe the number was around 25,000. In yeah, the... I think it's around twenty five to twenty seven thousand members. That doesn't include spouses or dependents. And um, I, I guess given the retirement numbers are changing every every year, um, it, do we have any sense of what percentage of sort of total retired members who are retired within the teachers pension plan? How many of those are part of the Green Shield plan? Uh, not off the top of my head, I can't answer that question. And I think what's important too is um, uh, retired teachers uh, may be covered under the Green Shield plan or other spousal plans uh, uh, that uh, they may elect to uh, mm -hmm. join Green Shields or or potentially re retired teachers have, have a plan as well that uh, some members uh, uh, join. Okay, thanks, Reg. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, a question for you, Joanne, when you mentioned that lifetime maximum of, of 200,000, um, the mm -hmm. question that we have here is um, for couples who are members, is that 200,000 per person or per couple? It's $200 per person. $200,000 is the oh, lifetime. Sorry, $200,000 yeah. lifetime maximum per person. That's perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, a question uh, from a member here, Joanne, in terms of um, those new or different paramedical providers. Mm -hmm. So there's a question about, you know, it, could we have acupressure um, uh, covered? What about osteopathy and sort of, um, mm -hmm. sort of different um, providers? So could you maybe speak to a little bit about if that's an option? It certainly is an option. We recognize the types of providers are expanding as there are different specialty areas, um, especially in the area of mental health. We uh, Organizations and other plans we work with are actually expanding to counselors and social workers as opposed to just a, um, a psychologist. So uh, really encourage you to do the survey because that is going to be something that we ask about with your desire to expand the list of practitioners beyond what we have today. Thanks, Joanne. Um, another question for you, uh, Joanne, is around coverage for cataract surgery. So someone's posted in the chat here that there's cost associated with that cataract surgery um, and um, if, if that could be covered through the plan. Unfortunately, it's not included and it typically is not, uh, that type of procedure is usually not covered under, under the plan. Um, Joanne, is that, this plan or all plans? Like all just plans. plans. All plans. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, there's a question looking for clarification, Joanne, around the deductible. Mm -hmm. um, and is the $200 annual deductible, um, and again, the, the, um, the, the question here says for drugs, per person or per couple? So is it that each individual who's in, in the plan, if you've got a, a couple, is it $200 collective or $200 for each before um, sort of those benefits kick in? That $200 is per individual. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and, and thank you. Um, uh, we're, we're trying to get through as many questions as, as we can. And um, there's, there's quite a few here. So I am going rapid fire, but um, we'll, we'll look to, um, to cover as many questions as possible. Um, so there's a question around um, um, dental implant. Um, if you have like a broken tooth or an injury, um, not a fun thing to spend money on. That's my addition to the question, <laughs> not, not wasn't posed in the question, but uh, is any of it covered if you are on the basic dental coverage, an implant, or is that considered major? Yeah, that would not be covered under the essential plan. Okay, thanks. So, and I don't believe you would it would even be covered under, typically dental implants are not covered under plans, <laughs> dental plans in general. Thanks, Joanne. Um, now um, I'll, I'll go to you first, Joanne and Reg, you may wanna jump in on this next one. Um, if you were to retire before sort of the new extended health and dental plans come into effect, should the board make that decision, um, 
would you get an upgrade into the plan? So let's say you retire in 2024 and you kind of sign up and you're part of the plan. Um, would you be able to kind of benefit from the, any changes that happen uh, in January 2025? So maybe you could just sort of speak to that transition period, Joanne, and then I'll check in with yeah. you, Reg, if there's anything you'd like to add. So if you enroll, anybody currently enrolled in the plan up to 2025 would be impacted and move together to the new plan in 2025. We would have a transition strategy. We don't know what that new plan will look like or even whether there will be changes to the plan. Um, so we will take everything, factor everything in and then make that decision. But that's why we are take, doing it slowly and having a slow, a long runway up to any potential changes because we need to do change management and communicate out to anybody that might be impacted from the change. And that would be include, include anybody who would sign up in 2024. They would have a year on it and then they would also move to the new plan in 2025. Thanks, Joanne. So just to kind of question. confirm, if you're in the plan, no matter when you join, everyone would move as a group to, to take part in any changes to the plan in January, 2025. Yes. Reg, is there anything you wanted to add from a board perspective in terms of this sort of potential transition to different benefits? Yeah, I think the board is um, sort of uh, fully aware of uh, needing to have some structure and time uh, to make sure that members are informed of the process and what's going on and, and uh, taking the time to consider the impacts of a change uh, that uh, that may be in front of us or uh, that we may need to contemplate. Uh, and so not rushing through uh, something uh, that uh, we haven't really uh, had the chance to fully consider. And so uh, with the help of, uh, of Joanne and, and experts that will be able to provide um, uh, uh, information to the board on how to make that as smooth a process as possible. Thanks, Reg, and thank you, Joanne. Um, a question for you, Joanne, around the dispensing fees and Costco. So uh, a member here here noted that they're they're saddened to hear that the plan sort of favors Costco, um, not them. And this is something that we heard in, in sort of the first um, phase of engagement of members who live in smaller, more remote communities or just not near Costco. Um, and so the question um, is really, um, is there any thought of changing this to make it more equitable? And the note here is around, you know, also wanting to support community-based small pharmacies. And so maybe you could talk through for us those trade-offs and, and what consideration would be given to um, potentially sort of trying to, to level the playing field in terms of that, that dispensing fee and the, and the, the coverage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we recognize that access to Costco is not for everybody. There's only 17 in British Columbia and they're usually in communities where there are larger populations. So it is something that we're looking at as part of the design because um, we, can, we can't make it um, perfect, but we are factoring in a plan that's the most equitable that we can make it without increasing costs. And, you know, it's all a balancing act because we don't want your premiums to be increased by 50%, but at the same time, we do recognize that uh, people live in more remote communities uh, without access to the favored um, co-insurance. So we have, that is definitely something we are considering in the design change. And we would absolutely encourage members to make note of that if that's something yeah. that you would um, like um, the plan to consider. Um, there's another question just for clarification, Joanne, around premiums and sort of the note um, in your slide was that um, sort of premiums are evaluated and, and looked at February 1st of every year. And mm -hmm. so the question is just, um, could your premiums then go up every year? And maybe if you can speak to where premiums have been at for this plan over the last few years. Mm -hmm. So if I talk about, maybe I'll focus on extended health. Um, premiums do tend to go up uh, with utilization. Of course, during the um, COVID, we weren't using paramedical practitioners. So the premiums, actually, I believe they might have gone down or maybe they stabilized, but they're all based on utilization. So 
members start using the plan more, more medications, more paramedical providers, just using it more. And also in addition to what we expect coming down the pipeline. So what new drugs are we expecting in the coming year? Uh, we're trying to anticipate, we look at history, but we also look ahead when we set the premiums for the coming year. And that's all about negotiating. Um, so our team at WTW, we do actuarial analyses and um, look at all of the environmental factors to see what where will premiums go. Um, so, I mean, it's a very complex uh, analysis, but essentially it's just based on utilization and any inflationary factors that we might be seeing in the coming years. We also look at drugs that are becoming generic because that's great news for a plan. Um, that'll really help bend the cost curve um, as well and help stabilize. And biosimilars and generics, all of those uh, types of products have helped keep like prices down or keep premiums in check in the past few years. Thanks, Joanne. Um, the next question I'll answer, uh, a member just um, posted a question about, is this the same information as tomorrow and as Thursday? Yes, it is the same information. There will obviously be different questions because there's different participants attending um, and our plan is only to record one of them. So um, it is the exact same information and we're really here to answer questions and to promote um, taking the survey. So I uh, wanted to address that. Um, there's, there's another sort of series of questions, jo Joanne, around eyes <laughs> and vision care. And so um, the question is around whether or not um, you could actually separate out the cost of glasses from the cost of the exam. So if you could have different benefits, so under that slide where you had vision care, it was just sort of vision bracket, including exams. Are there options to, um, to sort of uh, ensure that members have access to an exam, but that there's still a different kind of pot of money or benefit in terms of glasses? Absolutely. So again, that's another um, de plan design option that we're gonna be looking at. And the survey does have questions that uh, take a look at the eye benefit. And there are many plans designed that way where it's not together as one sum. So you don't eat away money that you wanna put towards your glasses. You have a separate amount for your examination. Thanks, Joanne. All of these do come with a cost, so we, that's why we have to look at the trade-offs. Absolutely. Uh, and just a reminder for folks, uh, we are quickly kind of running out of time. We have about eight more minutes, but I do want to just flag in the chat. Um, my colleague, Brittany, has posted the Green Shield customer service number. Um, and perhaps, Brittany, as you have time, you can repost a link to um, the benefit um, package so that um, uh, members can kind of take a look uh, for themselves as well there. Um, and so uh, a question about drugs for you, Joanne. Um, and the question is, how is a person to know which generic version of a drug uh, for, say, hypertension um, is available? Is that drug covered um, by Green Shield? So how do they know, basically, if they're on a generic or if they're on um, a brand name? And then how do they know what what's covered? That's a really good question. Uh, so ask your pharmacist. I think that's the best way of knowing if it's a generic or a brand. Is it covered by Green Shield? Well, if you want to go to the pharmacy and you get your drug filled, if they put it through the system, they can tell if it's covered or not. The pharmacist can tell. And you can also go on to Green Shield's um, member portal and put your drug in, in the member portal to find out whether it's being reimbursed. And you can also call Green Shield as well. Thanks, Joanne. Um, and so um, someone's asked, just to, said, I, I may have missed it. Um, and the yearly um, maximum benefit for uh, paramedical. And so I'm just going to share the, the screens, my screen, so that um, they can see here the providers that are currently listed under paramedical. And I think one of the things that we certainly heard in the first phase of engagement is that it is, is quite a difference between when you're actively working and when you're retired. And so that $1,000 is a combined yearly maximum for all providers. I just want to confirm that's correct, Joanne? That's correct. 
Thank you. So again, if, if um, increasing paramedical coverage um, is something that's important to you, um, again, we'd encourage you to complete the survey and let us know while at the same time recognizing um, that there are th those trade-offs need to take place in order to balance costs. So um, that's, um, that's also something. Uh, Again, I'm, I'm going as fast as we can here, Joanne and, and Reg, so thank you for, for bearing with me. Um, it, it retired teachers, active teachers, we've got lots of questions. Um, what is, uh, Joanne, the current maximum um, age for, um, I'd say, a child who's living at home who's covered under the family plan? So is there a maximum age if you have sort of a, an older adult child who's um, say in their twenties or thirties living at home? Is there an as age? As a dependent? Home? Yeah, as a dependent. Again, I'm going to take that away. Um, and I'm not sure how, Jessica, how are we posting uh, mm -hmm. questions that we so, are coming back to? Any questions- Maybe we could put that in a Q and A and FAQ. Absolutely. So any questions that are asked that we don't already have answered and posted on the website, we will update. And so we can take that one away because um, I think there's probably more than a few folks who are mm -hmm. interested in that. Um, so uh, another question um, is around sort of, and again, Reg, I'll, I'll check in with you. This may be one of those questions we need to take away and post. Uh, but the question is that many retired teachers are on call list um, in districts where they have retired from. So they might be, you know, called up uh, occasionally. So uh, on in this instance, um, just kind of confirming that their status is sort of retired is maintained. So they're still part of this sort of extended health benefit as a retired teacher and that on-call doesn't change their status. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, uh, as far as coverage, I believe that's a discussion and decision between the school district in which they work, uh, whether they elect to be uh, covered under benefits uh, or, or not. Thanks, Reg. Uh, Joanne, uh, a question for you around that 200,000 annual or lifetime maximum. Um, what happens if you hit that maximum? Um, if you hit that maximum, then there's no more coverage under the extent health, extended health care plan. So that's where we, you know, that's something that we may be able to look at at increasing that maximum to date. I think we've had very few people reach that maximum. That's why what will take you there would be drugs because most of the benefits are limited by annual maximums or, you know, maximums over two or four years, like your vision and hearing. It's really the medication. So that's where, you know, leveraging public programs like BC Cancer Agency, BC Pharmacare, um, there's also a program for expensive drugs or rare diseases in British Columbia. So that those are programs that we would encourage you to leverage to save room under your, your uh, private health care plan. So you don't reach your um, lifetime maximum. Thank you, Joanne. Um, there's a question here around home care services and um, just confirming that uh, a home care service would not be included in um, sort of this, this plan. Um, is it an option, however? Have you seen a home care service as a benefit that has been covered um, under extended health plans? No, I have not seen home care services, but again, in the survey, there are some areas where there's free text. So if you have any ideas or what you'd like to see your plan look like, please feel free to provide that feedback on the survey. And so we can compile all of that. And we see 20,000 people want home care services. Maybe that's something we have to look at. Thanks, but Joanne. it's definitely not something that's common. Um, I'm going to do my best to include two more questions. So there's a question about maximizing a partner's plan. So if there's two retired um, folks um, and they're on two different plans, um, can they um, join Green Shield to maximize the benefits under those two plans? So what does that coordination piece look like from your perspective, Joanne? So would the spouse be with another carrier or yes. they would choose? Yeah. So a plan, uh, the, uh, another, you know, the partners with a different plan. Yeah, they would have to stay with that carrier. So the spouse can't move to Green Shield to max. They would, the carrier is uh, 
the one assigned to that particular plan. So they can't move to Green Shield to optimize coordination. It doesn't matter if they're, the coordination is not enhanced if both of you are with the same carrier. So the coordination rules would be exactly the same as if you were with Green Shield and Green Shield or Green Shield and Pacific Blue Cross or Green Shield and Sun Life. Okay. Uh, uh, jo Joanne, I think, I think the question is, can, is it beneficial to have each, uh, maybe each spouse in a different plan so that if one covers 80%, they mm -hmm. could use the other to, to cover the other 20% of the claim? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, Reg, I, I don't, <laughs> I can't see the question. So that. Thank you, Reg and, and Joanne. That's correct, Reg. You can coordinate the balance. And, um, and can and can you also do that with green shields? Can you, if each uh, per each spouse as is a is a member on their own in green shields, they could coordinate coverage to get one hundred percent coverage. Yeah, as long as both plans cover that drug. So, what if one plan is on a formulary and it's very restrictive, and your plan does cover that drug, that other plan will pay zero dollars for the plan. But if the other plan covers that drug, if it's eligible then you can coordinate between the two to get full coverage. Thank you both. Um, there are a number of questions that um, we have not gotten to uh, at this time, but we will capture all of those. Um, and anything that is not already on our website, um, on the plans website, we will review. There was a note about, you know, how are people going to find out about it? And it is, um, it is challenging because there isn't a sort of big master database of emails. So thank you to those of you who are here. Uh, I know that the Pension Corporation is doing its level best to promote this on the website in the um, sort of retired um, magazine that went out, the retirement magazine, um, and through social media, um, as well as through um, associations and employer newsletters. So um, we will continue to um, do our best to promote the survey that will go live on uh, September 18th and will be open until October 10th. If there is anyone who feels like, I don't want to do a survey, I want to talk to a real person, and then I encourage you to call me to reach out. We've included our phone number and email um, in the chat, and it is also on the website. Um, and uh, we would absolutely encourage you to let folks know about this. Uh, and uh, we really uh, want to report out on everything that we hear. And that report, it will happen in early 2024. I um, want to thank all of you uh, for joining us this evening, and it will be the exact same format tomorrow and on Thursday, um, but if you want to come and, and sort of repost a question, or if we unfortunately didn't get to the 40 plus questions we received, um, then uh, by all means, you are welcome to attend. So um, with that, I want to thank everyone and uh, encourage you to stay well and uh, to, uh, to let folks know about this opportunity. So thank you, everyone. And we wish you a good night. Thank you. Thanks, Reg. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks. Good night, all.